Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the Hockey Think Tank podcast brought to you by the HockeyThinkTank.com, a website for all players, parents, and coaches to go to get a little bit of education and a little bit of inspiration regarding the greatest game on the planet. What an episode we have for you guys here today. We are bringing on former major league pitcher. He was the ninth overall draft pick of the Detroit Tigers in the 2009 draft. He played seven seasons of professional baseball with five different organizations. And now he is helping a lot of young athletes manage their money. What an awesome conversation this was. The ups, the downs, the twists, the turns, and everything in between. Thank you so much to Jacob Turner for coming on the podcast with us. Before we do get over to Jacob, though, let's bring on the talent of the podcast, Jeffrey. Jehu, Zoolander man himself, Lavecchio. Vex, what's up today, brother? I'm having a great day, bro. It's uh, We're recording this on Tuesday. You guys are listening on Monday or later, uh, but it's really cool. It's like Christmas break week. So I had, I think today I probably had like 16 to 18 college and junior players home um, all in the gym. Yesterday I had 12 or 13 uh, so just a really, really fun time with me because, you know, I have a really deep bond with all the guys that I work with in the off season because I only take a, a like a set amount of guys and then I don't take anyone else. And then you're with me four days a week, every single week for anywhere from four to five and a half months to pe- three, maybe four and a half months, depending on, you know, your age and how long your off season is. So really fun for me at Christmas when all the boys come back in. The workouts are a lot more laid back. Um, you know, I'm not even timing the rest, which usually like I'm like crazy about rest times. And it's like way more laid back, chill, just like everybody's talking to everybody about their how their season's going. And I could see all the boys. So um it was a really, really fun day for me today. There you go. There Good you go. Mood. Connecting with people, man. It's a big thing. People connect them with people. <laughs> what was that? I don't know why I said it like that. I, have no I don't idea. know what I'm doing with my hands. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my hands. Never. <laughs> oh, man. That's really good. I had a productive day. Dude, like, I have to say this, and I feel like I've said it the last couple times, but I don't care. Um, I just want to thank everybody out there that has reached out about this organization blueprint that we're doing right now. Um, I've been literally on Zooms all day, every day during the week for like hockey directors, coaches, parent, like everybody who thinks this, that this can provide value to your youth organizations. And like, I'm honestly like, I'm having a ton of fun because I'm meeting a lot of new people too. Like I'm having conversations with people in South Carolina and then Alberta and then Arizona and then Boston and like anything and everything in between. And man, like I'm learning a lot. And also I'm just like very humbled with the amount of people that have reached out that want to work with us. And so like, I sincerely want to say like a thank you to, to everybody that's done that. And, and also like, you know, we're really passionate about this organization blueprint. If you haven't heard about what it is, we did a whole podcast episode on it a few weeks back and, you know, we're going in there and we're working with a ton of youth organizations to provide some perspective and procedures and, and streamline stuff for, club leadership level, hockey directors board to the coaches, to the players, to the parents. Like this week I had a parent call with the Penn's elite organization, you know, and, and like so many different things that we have going on. I'm a busy dude (laughs) right now, which is awesome. So again, like, thank you to everybody that's reached out on that. I I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, getting to work with and, and try to change the culture of youth hockey, one organization at a time, like I just very, very humbled. So if you want some more information on that, again, we did a podcast on it uh, a few weeks ago called the youth, youth organization blueprint. And you can also find all the information on hockey think tank.com. So um, pretty cool stuff, man. I love that. And the goal with all that and, and teaching how to build culture within these youth organizations and all, you know, doing things the right way and stuff is to make great human beings like our guest tonight, Jacob Turner. Like, like, you know, he played hockey growing up. He played, he played baseball. You know, I've talked to him about like conversations he had with his dad and like stuff like that. And he's just a really, really good person. I've known him a couple years. Um, we had entrepreneurship group meetings for, you know, a, a while there. Life's gotten busy here. We got to get back to it. Um, but he's just a really good person. He loves helping people. He cares about people. And his story, I think is, I think, I think that so many 
players who aren't, you know, the, I don't know who it is in baseball, but like, you know, that aren't the Sidney Crosby or aren't the Connor McDavid. Like, it's amazing to look up to those people, but I think the people who went through ups and downs and twists and turns and had to battle and stuff like that, I think they can teach the masses way more about life, about the sport, about resiliency, like we talked a lot on this podcast about, than the superstars can. You know, I don't, I, I think that the, these types of players, you had, obviously had an amazing career, top 10 uh, uh, pick in the MLB draft, uh, one of the, you know, most uh, coveted signings coming out of high school. Um, I think we can learn, but then up and down career, I think we can learn a lot from people like this. Hundred percent, man. I totally agree. I a hundred percent agree. And the best ones too, like you know, there's some people that leave the game, and most people that leave the game, like their career didn't necessarily go as planned. <laughs> Everybody kind of when they start thinks they're going to be a Hall of Famer at some point or have these long, you know, careers. But I think people that leave the game not bitter and and just. Um, almost like grateful for the experiences that they've had and the lessons that they've learned that they're going to be able to use once they're done with the sport and now they have to transition into something outside of that. Like for me, those are the best role models. Cause you know, too, like there's some people who have a lot of angst and people who point a lot of fingers leaving this game too. And so I love people like Jacob who have a genuine love for the experience, even if the experience didn't go exactly as planned, you know, learned a lot along the way. And now he's paying that back and paying that forward to the next generation of people coming through, particularly everybody that's going to listen to this podcast. And if you follow him on social media and stuff, just like so much unbelievable information that can help you be the best at what you do and just give you some real time perspective on what life is all about. It was really, really insightful conversation, man. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, he's got a ton of wisdom. Like he's he's very wise, you know. He's lived he's lived a lot and he's seen a lot and done a lot and been all over the world and and been in rooms with some some pretty pretty crazy people in his career, but even more so probably post career in the last couple of years with what he's doing now. Um so just a really cool guy. I'm very glad that he donated his time. We didn't even get to this on the podcast, but his son is playing hockey. Um, you know, <laughs> so he's calling dad. me. He's he's texting me like, Hey man, where can I get some skates from? And I'm like <laughs> I'm give you an old pair of mine. What size you know you're enormous. They're not gonna fit you. <laughs> but I do have this cousin in Chicago. Yeah, his his skate will fit on your pinky skates finger. Does, yeah, some five year olds. But anyway, um, no man, this was really good. And for the kids that are out there listening to this right now, like there are, is some real wisdom is probably the right thing, but advice, wisdom, whatever you want to call it. Like we talk about the ups and the downs and how to get through those. We talk about how to earn your confidence. We talk about consistency. We talk about routine and, and coming from a guy who's, who's sat in the places that he sat, like this is some real time talk, man. This is some real time stuff that can really, really help you on your journey to be the best version of what you can be. So highly, highly, highly recommend listening to this and then like if you're a coach like sending this to your team <laughs> of of players um and if you're a parent like having your your son or your daughter listening to it too i, I think um man, there's just a lot of really good stuff in here a lot of really good stuff i'm so glad you said that about coaches sending this to your team because i have to tell you so um i had a mom of a team reach out to me maybe she's a manager super nice lady of the cincinnati junior cyclones um, they were in town playing four games this weekend uh, against uh, AAA Blues and Car Shield teams, and they were like, "Hey, coaches sent out the Hockey Think Tank podcast in the beginning of the year, and they made the players write papers on it, and they send them different episodes to listen to, and then they talk about it as a team." And I got to meet the coaches and uh, a couple of the parents, and I had a quick talk with them. I put them through a little dynamic warm up, and the kids were awesome, and it was so cool to meet a bunch of young hockey players i want to say they were like 12 maybe um meet a bunch of young hockey players playing triple a and and you know their coaches are are making the players listen to the podcast and the kids all knew who i was when i walked up and and uh you know, the coaches said how much our podcast has helped the dad who I was talking to had said how much it, you know, he said that we were talking about, he brought up Cassidy, uh, dot Cassidy Preston, who was on a few episodes ago and how, um, he was like, Ooh, 
they were saying to do this and I'm doing this. I'm going to start trying to do this. And so we were laughing about it. Um, you know, the car ride home, what are you asking first? You know, did you have fun? Did you work hard? Not like, you know, the other stuff. So we had a good laugh about that, but it's really, really cool to meet a team in person, uh, uh, of coaches and players that listen to us. So coaches, if you ever doing that, if you're ever in St. Louis, please reach out to me. Any team that asks me to come speak that listens to our podcast and they're in St. Louis, I come every single time. I will, I will be wherever you're at. As long as I'm not doing something, I'll come and meet you guys. I've had teams <laughs> in my gym, whatever, you know? So I love that. I will come every time. As long as I'm not doing something, I will come every <laughs> I meant time. Like, I meant, but like, I'll come after the game, or I'll have them. If I can't be at the game, I'll bring you to my gym. Like I had your team in there to teach them hand eye and stuff. Like yeah, that, that was so awesome. Anyway, yeah. I can help our listeners. You know, just hit. Same me. here. Same here. If you're in Chicago, um, reach out. I, I I can't promise anything with <laughs> with the the load of daughters that I have and responsibilities with that but for sure reach out I'd love to and, and I've done that too like I we, I work we do this organization blueprint with the Ohio Junior Blue Jackets AAA team out of Columbus and um yeah like I I went to a few of their games when they were in Chicago for for a tournament and That's awesome. yeah yeah so reach out man we we appreciate it we we love the feedback and we love interacting with you guys so Um, thank you. Actually, you want a funny story before we get over to Jacob about the Cincinnati Cyclones? So my first ever professional road game was in Cincinnati. And so I had just finished my season at Cornell. I signed with Elmira in the East coast league and my first ever game was at home. But then my first away game was in Cincinnati and it was fan appreciation night and it was jam packed. It was like sold out and they have a sick arena. There's like 10,000, 12,000 seats or something like that. Um, and they were really good that year. And so I'll never forget. Uh, I go out for a four on four situation and there's a face off in our defensive zone. I'm facing off against David DeHarnay. You remember David DeHarnay? Yeah. Yeah. So for the listeners out there, David DeHarnay is about my size. If he's not an inch taller than me, maybe two inches taller than me, but he's really, really small. And how good was he? He played in the NHL for how many years as a five foot, probably six, five foot seven player. Um, and so he was in the coast at the time. He was a young kid. And so I ended up taking the draw against him. And every coach I've ever played for in a four on four situation, if you lose the draw as the center, like you're going out to the point and then the defenseman picks up the center. I don't know if that's how you played, but that's always how I played is as a center. If you lose the draw, you're going out to that strong side defenseman. The other winger is going to pick up the weak side defenseman. And then our defenseman will, um, pick up the center in our system in four and four. It was not that, but they didn't tell me that. Oh, <laughs> and so oh, no. the D that was on the wall went out to the D and I was supposed to stay on the center. So both of us ended up going out to the D and that defenseman was like, Oh, okay. And he just feathered a pass like to the, there wasn't anybody even near day Harnay right around the net. He he gets the pass. He's got like a million seconds to deke out our goal. He ends up scoring place goes nuts, 10,000 people. And I get back to the bench and the coach is like, what are you doing? Like, why did you go out to the D? And I was like, I, I don't, it's what I've always done. And he was like, no, you stay with the center. And I was like, oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll do that next time. And maybe, so, maybe tell me that. Exactly. Right. So it was just really funny. I remember that because like the place went banana, like it was a loud 10,000, yeah. 12,000, whatever it was. And it was obviously my, like I was the guy that messed up yeah. and uh, I'll never forget looking back and day hard. Just nobody around him. By nobody himself. around. He was like the leading scorer in the coast at the time. Oh, and, perfect. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Just leave him alone. Just leave him wide open. So. <laughs> Your second game. <laughs> Anyways, Cincinnati Cyclones. That's my uh that's my story. She moves her it. body like a cyclone. <laughs> so you remember that song? <laughs> yeah, it's a college song for sure. All night long. <laughs> Great uh all right. So before we get over to Jacob, we have some people to thank. First people we want to thank is Gel Sticks. The best. Hey guys, Christmas time coming up. Christmas time coming up. Actually, when this goes out, I think it's gonna be Christmas. Day. I think that's Monday or maybe Christmas Eve. So maybe a little bit late, maybe a New Year's present. Anyways, go to gelsticks.com, weighted training sticks. They are awesome. G-E-L-S-T-X.com. Use the coupon code Think Tank One Word, and you will get a discount on your weighted training sticks. Jeff Free. Uh, I want to thank Train Heroic. Train Heroic is the awesome platform where I house all of my online training. 
Uh, if you are a team, you are an organization, you want to train with me in season or during the off season, I can facilitate that for very cheap. I offer Zoom calls with every team I work with every month. All you got to do is hit me up when you want to call um, nutrition, mindset, recovery, books to read, pregame routines, training, all this stuff I cover on these calls to offer as much value as I can to every single player, parent and coach of the teams and organizations I work with. So thank you so much, Train Heroic, for allowing me to work with so many players and have a positive impact on their careers. Also want to thank Cure Nutrition. Cure Nutrition is the CBD company that I use every single day, twice a day. This stuff helps me massively, guys. Keeps my my brain functioning at optimal levels, keeps my body recovering from training. Um, there's so many different reasons why CBD and how CBD can help you. If you have questions on it, please just reach out to me and ask. Um, I've been using it, like I said, since 2017, 2018, and it's really, really helped me um, in my entrepreneurship journey too, just with all the stress and things like that helps with stress management. But you can go to curednutrition.com, use my discount code GMBM, or reach out to me, ask questions. I'll help you any way I can. There we go. Boom. Thank you to Helios Hockey. Unbelievable product. You get a sensor that you put into your shoulder pads and you get real-time feedback on some amazing hockey stuff. Number one, stride mechanics, right? It's going to help you with your stride mechanics, give you instant feedback on your stride. Number two, you get a hustle score. There's a hustle score that you can get, which is a really, really cool feature, particularly for the younger kids. Um, and, and it goes based on your movement and, and how hard you're going, how fast you're going uh, within your practice or within your game. And game changer this will sync up with whatever video you are using, whether it's your camera, whether it's your phone, whether it's an iPad or whether it's Live Barn, and you will get your shifts when you are moving cut up for you instantly after the game. Absolute game changer. Outside of the feedback, which is amazing, you're also getting your shifts cut up for you that you can watch. I wish I would have had this when I was younger. Uh, would have been really, really cool. Um, but it, we have a partnership with Helios, and if you are a new Helios member, the Hockey Think Tank listeners get a discount code. So go to Helios Hockey and use the coupon code Think Tank again, and all new members will get 20% off their initial 12 month membership. And that sensor in your shoulder pad, you get in that for free. So awesome partnership with them. And then thank you also to icehockeysystems.com, the best website out there for everything and anything coaching education. They got thousands of drills for you to choose from, whiteboard explanations from really, really high level hockey people. Uh, just a great resource, but also it's a resource to be able to draw up your drills, send them to your teams, send them to your players. Uh, we have partnered with them to do an associations platform where you can ridiculously, ridiculously low price get this for every coach within your organization. Again, building up a drill library. If you're a hockey director out there, building up a drill library for your organization game changer, absolute game changer. What a resource for the coaches that are coming from their regular jobs to practice might not have enough time to really, really dive into a practice plan. This just helps them so, so, so much. Um, also we use it all the time. So with all the coaches that we do this organization blueprint with, we have a call with them every Tuesday, any coach when these organizations can be involved in the call. And, uh, I used ice hockey systems the last couple of weeks to draw up a few drills, uh, to give to the coaches and kind of go through it and talk about the details of it with all the coaches that were on there. And so it's, man, it's just like such an unbelievable tool. We use it all the time. Also like guys, like we say this too, but we're not partnering with companies that we don't believe in and that we don't use. Like, honestly, you would be surprised at how many companies have come to us that want us to promote their stuff. And we're like, nah, no, thanks. <laughs> these are, these are extremely big value ads and, and we care about our listeners a lot and we want to make sure that you're getting the best value and the best things that can actually help you. And so all these things that we're talking about right now, just phenomenal, phenomenal people that are running these companies and phenomenal, phenomenal products. Um, so we love you guys. Thank you so much for continuing to support our podcast. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. We love you. Anything that we can do for you, we love the feedback. Give us ratings, shoot us reviews, email us, like DM us on social media. We're always looking to get better too. And we want to provide you guys with the best content out there possible. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are going to absolutely love this conversation. So here we go with former major league baseball pitcher, Jacob Turner.
we are so excited to have on this episode of the podcast right there in Jeffrey Jehu Lavecchio's backyard. We have Jacob Turner. Jacob, what's going on, my man? Guys, thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation today. Yes. Yeah, us, us too. Us too. Well, Vex, I know you guys know each other really well. Um, but Jacob, obviously an un, unreal career, uh, got the chance to play at the highest level of the major leagues. And, and I'm really excited to dive into that. But first, uh, you know, typically when we get people on here that have played at higher levels, one of the things we like to ask them is, is just how they fell in love with it. And so, you know, growing up in the St. Louis area, you're obviously back there now, but, uh, how'd you end up falling in love with, uh, the game of baseball? I know hockey might've been a little, little wrinkle in there too. A little bit of a hockey player as you were growing up too. Yeah, well, I think it started because I had two brothers. So I'm in the middle of three. And I mean, essentially growing up in St. Louis, like all my brothers and I ever did was sports. I can remember the very first time we ever got like satellite TV and we got Sports Center, And it was like Sports Center was on nonstop in our house whenever we get home from school. So sports were a huge part of our life. Um, baseball and hockey really were the two biggest things. And I would say growing up, I actually loved ice hockey, but I had a, a, a little bit of a knee injury when I was in seventh grade. And at the same time, I was kind of getting better at baseball. So my parents were kind of pushing me towards like, hey, why don't we stick to baseball? And it obviously ended up working out really well. I played, uh, I got drafted in 2009, 11 years professionally until 2019 and had a lot of ups and downs throughout that career. So looking forward to unpacking some of that. That's crazy, man. So you, you like you mentioned, you got drafted early, but you you for what's the even word for go for gone did not go to college because you got drafted so high. Where'd you go Vex. to school? Though? Where'd Vex. you go to school? What's the word, Vex? You uh, you googly, I believe. The word would be googly. <laughs> you you googly. Okay, gotcha. Uh, but you didn't end up going to college. I was wondering about that, just kind of looking at at your journey there. How hard of a decision? Because I know you were committed to go to University of North Carolina, which is a huge baseball school. Um, but you decided to um, to go play pro. You know what what went into that decision, and is that a decision you kind of look back on now? Um, with obviously hindsight 2020, like, would you have, I don't want to say, would you have done things differently, but just having the the benefit of some, you know, years under your belt now, would you have gone about thinking about it differently? Let's say, um, as you were going through that process of trying to decide what to do. Yeah. I mean, look in baseball, the way the draft works is you can get drafted out of high school. If you get drafted and essentially the team offers you enough money that you want to forego your college career you can start as a professional right there at 18 years old so going into my senior year of high school my parents were really big on school my dad uh was a dentist so technically he was a doctor so i'd always give him a hard time about that but my dad was you know spent a bunch of years uh going to college going to med school my mom had an accounting background so school was a huge part of our life and they were very adamant that i was going to school and i i really wanted to go to school like north carolina was an amazing school chapel hills a ton of fun on the baseball program was really elite at the time. And ultimately, I ended up having probably as good a year as I could possibly have my senior year of high school. And essentially, the Tigers just offered me enough money plus enough of a commitment on their end that I would get really significant opportunity with them that it was just too much to pass up. So that's how I ended up signing. And as I think about like the journey of me signing as an 18-year-old, it's kind of wild to think about that you go from, I mean, I went from a high schooler with 120 kids in my graduating class to becoming a professional athlete playing with 30 year old men two weeks later. And I don't know if I would go back and do it differently, so to speak. Um, look, there's certain things that college gives you that like I will never get. I did online college, so I never got like the college experience, so to speak. But I also got this really unique life experience as an 18 year old where I essentially had to grow up really fast from the time I was 18 to 21, because while sports was still fun, it was a business, right? Like you guys paid me millions of dollars to go out there and perform. They were expecting me to be a professional from the day I got there, even though I was just an 18 year old. What was that like? That, that must've been pretty crazy. I mean, w when you talk about it in, in the way that you just did, you know, you're <laughs> with your buddies in high school graduating. And then all of a sudden you get this huge sum of money. Now in your bank account, you go from probably <laughs> like hundred bucks in your bank account to <laughs> a zillion times that. Um, but then also comes with it, like the added, 
um, pressure of being a professional athlete. You know, you're surrounded by people who potentially have families. And that's one of the things that a lot of young guys in, in pro hockey see is like, you know, they come in there as a young kid and all of a sudden they're fighting for playing time or they're fighting for spots on a team with, with guys who have to feed their family by what they're doing, as opposed to doing it as a passion when you're a younger kid. Right. And so what was that transition like for you? And what were some of the biggest things that you learned going from high school senior to holy crap, <laughs> here we go. I'm, I'm in professional baseball now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a whirlwind for sure. Like you get drafted and you think you're on top of the world. I mean, I know as an 18 year old, I thought I was the coolest person in the world. Like I just got drafted first over, or first round by the Tigers. Like I'm the guy, right? So I go to, I remember I went to Comerica Park for two days, big leagues place. And they put you on the jumbo trial and you feel like a big leaguer for two days. And then like on day three, you're at the spring training facility in Lakeland, Florida. For people that haven't been to Lakeland, Florida, it's when you're passing through from Tampa to Orlando and it's the middle of central Florida and there's really nothing there. So I go there and much to your point, Topher, I mean, I was surrounded by guys that were looking at me as like this 18 year old kid who signed for all this money. Like, is this guy going to come in and work hard? Is he just going to be entitled? Like you essentially you have a target on your back. And I think that's one thing that people miss about professional sports. It's like it is a business. And there are people that have been doing this for years by the time I got there and they might be on their last opportunity, or their last leg. And then they see this young kid come in as an 18 year old that signed for all this money thinking like, okay, well, he's here to take my spot. And it's this weird dynamic where you're on the same team as people, but at the same time, much to your point, like there's guys there that are looking just to feed their family to make it to the next year. Yeah, that's such a weird dynamic in pro sports that that it's so interesting. And and so within that, I remember – what Tope was saying there as far as, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's so different with the guys who have families, the guys like you who are young and like all they're thinking about is, is being a pro athlete. And this is amazing. And the other guys, it's like, it's a lot more of a job as you get older and like you have to perform and stuff like that. And I remember the first ever NHL camp I went to was with the Capitals and the coach came in and he said, the best thing you guys all have going for you is that you're not married. The worst thing that you guys all have going for you is that you're not married. And I remember being like, what the hell did this guy just say? And then right when I turned pro two years later and I got there and I saw what like the locker room dichotomy was of young guys in between and married guys with kids. I was like, now I get what that guy was saying a few years ago. It is it is really weird yeah. as far as far as you stepping in at that young age in baseball back then. Uh, it was so interesting what you said. I went from like high school baseball to like the MLB. D did they have somebody there mentoring yeah. you? Did, like, <laughs> you know, like how did that go? Yeah, right. Yeah, they, they assigned <laughs> a guy just a mentor, Jacob Turner. <laughs> no, unfortunately, uh, I think people think that, right? Like, oh, that you're like this first round pick. Well, I have this guy, like, he'll give you a call on your first day, make sure it goes smoothly. Uh, my first day was big league spring training. So the way it works in baseball is it's spring training. You have big league spring training, which is essentially like, let's call it 60 guys that they think could potentially make the 25 man roster. And then you have minor league spring training, which is everybody else in the organization. So the way that my deal is structured, I got to go to big league spring training my very first year. Now, look, I'm totally naive to this. I didn't even, I didn't even understand like how big of a deal it was. And I'm coming from high school, right? So like my warm up routine took 20 minutes. Like I literally put on my cleats, walked out there, maybe ran for 20 minutes or, you know, ran a pole. And then I was playing catch. I'm like, all right, I'm good to go. And we get to the very first day of spring training. I rolled into the locker room like 30 minutes before stretch. And all the media is there, right? It's the first day of spring training. But like, how would I know that the media was going to be there? And all the guys were like already dressed. They've already stretched. They've been foam rolling all this stuff. And like, Here's this 18 year old kid just rolling really late to the party. And I really wish I would have had that mentor that would have called me and told me, like, hey, Jacob, make sure you show up like at least 90 minutes before this. That's so wild, man. I like, obviously, times were different and now we like understand all this stuff. But it's like, dude, you were taking like function stats in Spanish two a month ago. <laughs> And, and you have no idea reporters are going to be waiting for you. And like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's so like now, I, I don't know how baseball is now, 
But in hockey now, like mentorship is like a really big deal. And they'll keep guys towards the end of their career that are really good locker room guys who are really good at mentoring the younger players. And in the AHL, the league below the NHL, that's a really, really important role for the, pl- the pros coming up for their first couple of years of pro and those older guys to show them like, this is how it is. Like you gotta be, you gotta live like a pro. You gotta be a pro. Um, and it's so wild, you know, that you, you top 10 pick in baseball and, and they don't even tell you, you know, to come and come early. Cause it's just, it's wild to me looking back. Like, uh, um, did you ever assume that role when you were an older pro and help the younger guys out? Yeah, well, to your first point, like in baseball, when I first signed, we had a really veteran team, and this is 2009, and the Tigers had, you know, I'd say five to six guys that were like 32, 33 plus years old. And now, when you look at like baseball, you know, much to your point, Jeff, like that guy that is the mentor now is gone, and he's been replaced by a young guy that they can pay less money that that looks good um, in the algorithm they're running for the team. And to your second point, uh, my last year playing in the States, which was 2018, I made the team out of spring training with the Marlins. Uh, we get like two weeks into the season. I have a terrible performance. I get sent to AAA. Long story short, I'm getting released from AAA. I'm like, I'm done. Like, I just don't. I'm over this. I call my agent, tell him I'm done. He ends up getting me like a deal within the next 12 hours. So I'm like, all right, I'll take the deal. So I go to AAA with the Tigers. And my whole goal was like, I'm like, hey, I'm going to be the guy that like can be a sounding board for any of these young guys that, you know, think that, you know, they haven't made or think that it's going to be easy or have questions, want to know like what they could do to get better. And honestly, it was some of the most fun I've ever had in the locker room because I had no expectations outside of just like, I want to be a great teammate. I want to try to win when I go out there. And if I can help these guys get better and understand some of the lessons that I wish I would have known when I first got to AAA, uh, that'd be a huge win. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, a lot of the mentoring that you kind of have to do is, is teaching guys how to handle the highs and lows, right? Because in professional sports there, there's a lot of them, especially in baseball with, (laughs) I can't, I can't even imagine playing 162 freaking games. Like, you know, the, the, the mental toughness and, and just the consistency by which you need to prepare has to be just otherworldly. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering because like, we talk about resiliency a lot on this podcast. It's it's something that everybody that we know that has, you know, achieved their dreams in this game, it, it's never been on a straight line. It's always had a lot of ups and downs and twists and turns along the way. And so how how do you kind of talk about that now? And how important is that even in what you're doing in, in life after baseball is just talking about that resiliency. Um, because yeah, like, and, and even for, like when you sign your contract, you're not playing in Detroit right away. Like you got to earn your stripes and, and you're playing a ball and you got to earn your way up with, with your performance and, and how you play. Um, and it, for a lot of baseball players that might be the first time they've ever been cut <laughs> or sent down or whatever you want to call it. So like how, how much does the building of resilience play into, you know, the mentoring that you were doing towards the end of your career and, and even looking back now on it a couple of years after you're done, um, just how, how powerful do you think that is? Well, look, I tell everybody, like everybody loves to ask the question about like, well, if you were, if you were me and you were doing it all over again, how would you help? And essentially they're always talking about their kid, like get to play professional sports. And what I tell them every single time without a doubt is like, let your kid learn the lessons that sports teaches them and however far they take that, it will help them further in life. And I think the number one thing that sports teaches you is how to fail because in life, how successful you are. I don't care who you look at. It's like, man, that's the person I want to be like, they have failed far more times than they've succeeded. And the only reason why they're succeeding today is because they learned how to fail. They learned how to get back up and learn from the lessons. They learned how to move on. Because in professional sports, and, and you guys can speak to this from the hockey perspective, so much of success in professional sports comes from being able to move on quickly, right? So you have these big performances in front of all these people and you fall flat on your face. And then you're expected to wake up the next day and do it all over again and not think about it at all. And I'll give like a specific example. So I went to the Blues game the other night with my son who's getting into hockey. 
And we go to the game and they're playing the Dallas Stars. And within the first, I don't know, let's call it 10 minutes, the Stars scored two goals. They got like eight shots on goal. The Blues have one, just absolutely dominating. And they score the second goal. And Bennington, who's playing goalie, he gives up the second goal. And I like specifically watch I'm like, I wonder what he's doing to like kind of reset the system. And he like skated off the side, basically like hit his pads a couple of times. But you can almost tell like when he got back in the net, it was like, hey, I'm, I'm like ready to go again. Well, they ended up winning the game four to three in overtime. And that's the epitome of resiliency, right? Like in the first 10 minutes, this guy's like, man, like I just put us in a hole, a 2-0 hole. Yet he sat there and he figured out how to make himself better and prepare for the rest of the game and keep the team in it. Dude, I love, I absolutely love that. And I, I that's something that I'm constantly preaching with every player I work with, especially young ones. Like what you're going through right now is hard, but like, I promise you that this is going to help you be successful in the rest of your life, no matter how long you play hockey. Like hockey is what you're obsessed with right now. You know, you're embarrassed that you had a bad game or you got cut or this or that, but like, keep going, keep going. Like, I think that what you said right there is, probably the most important thing we could ever say on this podcast is that like ho- sports hockey this is a hockey podcast. Like they teach that they, th- the most important thing is how to fail and turn it around right away. Learn from it, move on like, bam, it's not the end of the world because in sports you got to practice tomorrow. You got to play tomorrow. You got a game tomorrow. You got a game in two days. You got to be able to rebound after your best performances and not get too high. And you also got to rebound after your worst performances and not get too low and still go out there and do your job. And it's so important for that lesson for kids in school and life, especially with all these kids with anxiety and ADHD and social media and this and that everything's being thrown at them. It's really important to be able to learn these lessons and we can teach them through sports, something that kids love to do and talk about. Um, that's really, that's really interesting what you were just talking about there. And one of the things that Vex and I talk so much on this podcast about is resiliency and and the importance of resiliency to, you know, not just becoming a great athlete, but just being great at life and, and being fulfilled and even happy in life. And I, I wanted to ask you, because I, I, as we were talking about off air, I, I am a bit of a White Sox fan, but I, I got recommended a book called The Cubs Way. And it was how Theo Epstein turned the Cubs uh, from kind of hundred year losing organization to, to winning a world series. And the biggest part that I took out of this book, and I talk about this a lot when I do team building with, with younger kids is one of the first things that he did when he took over the Cubs is they kind of threw away the old scouting manual and the new one that they created. One of the most important things that was at like the top of every single one of the sheets when they were looking to either draft or sign somebody what are three times that this person has dealt with adversity on the field? And what are three times that this person has dealt with adversity off the field? And, and I know you spent some time in Chicago with the Cubs organization. And so I, I kind of wanted to ask you, like, was that something that was top of mind when you were there? And, and just like, you know, even being a, a mentor, as we were talking about, was that something that you would talk to the younger guys about just how important it was to get through the lows and how to get through the lows and that it's a part of the process, right? So um, just just talk a little bit about resiliency and maybe a little bit of your time in Chicago and how that manifested there. Yeah, well, if you think about even the the success that the Cubs had in 2015 uh, when they won the World Series in 2016 was they signed Jake Arrieta. So Jake Arrieta um, won a World Series there. He won a Cy Young there. But before that, he was with the Orioles, and essentially he was kind of left for dead. Like he had gone from being opening day starter to being in AAA, and he goes to the Cubs, and he really like revitalizes his career and figures it out. And I think so much of that is – when you think about guys that are at the professional level, if you take out, let's call it the top 5% of guys that have all the talent in the world where they just have some God-given ability that's just better than you, and you look at the other 95% of guys where they all have roughly equal talent level, I think there's two things that separate them. And the first thing is the resiliency. And, you know, Jeff, you mentioned it. It's not just doing well after you have a bad performance it's also saying when i have a good performance how do i stay even deal with it and really the second piece of that is confidence right so how do i create a routine that whether i have a great performance or whether i have a terrible performance i can come back the next day i can have that same level of confidence when i step on the field so whether that routine is what you do before the game what you do during the game what you do in the biggest moment of the game what you do after the game to kind of reset the system 
but having some sort of routine that allows you to really be consistent. And Max Scherzer um, gave me this line, and it's the most incredible line, but he said, confidence is a choice. Like when you come to the field every day, you get to choose if you want to have confidence or not. And I think it goes back to like, if you can have that routine, you can walk to the field every day and, and choose to have confidence. So I'd be curious to hear from your guys' perspective on the on the hockey side, like what that routine looked like for you guys to be able to come to the, the arena every night with confidence. It's everything, man. It's absolutely everything. It's very, very similar. I love what you said there too. Confidence is a choice because it, it really is. Confidence isn't something yet that you just have or you don't. Confidence is something, and Vex and I talk about this all the time. It's something that you earn through your daily routine and and the work that you put into to the skills that you have. Um, and so, yeah, like, and, and this is something, honestly, Jacob, and I know you're working with a lot of people in, in kind of like their transition sometimes into baseball and then probably out of baseball too. But like, it's almost a lesson that I've learned more since I've been done with hockey where everything isn't so structured for you and people aren't coaching you and telling you what to do all the time and pushing you out of your comfort zone and stuff. I've really learned how important the routine is afterwards, especially as an entrepreneur, when it's up to me, like it's only up to me. I have no coaches. Like I have no people to be accountable to like, and so then you really learn about how that routine, but yeah, like for, for us and Vex, I'll let you talk about it too. Like routine is everything. It's absolutely everything. It keeps you accountable to what you do. It, it pushes you every day and without it, like I would feel lost hundred percent. And and I would even take it further than like, like just a routine, like your routine leading up to games is what earns your confidence. Did I practice well this week with details? Okay. Well I did. So now I believe in myself. I know I did the right thing. So now I go into the game. If I ate well, if I slept well, if I watch my video, if I did my workouts, you go into games with more confidence because you did the work that earns the confidence. Like confidence isn't a pill. Somebody could just give you, you can't buy confidence. Like you earn it through your choices, you know? So I think that's for me, I think that's how you choose confidence. And I love Jacob, what you said there too, about like, okay, maybe I didn't get the result, but like, I want to still have confidence built off of the good things I did in the game. And so this is an area where I help a lot of players. I do these calls and I do a lot of them. And what was really cool is I gave this exact speech that I have these calls with players all the time, every week to TPH St. Louis, which I'm working with this year as their, their head strength coach. And one of the guys that I told them about and used as an example actually came to the school today. He's a division one commit. He'll be playing division one hockey next year. Um, and he plays in the USHL. He got traded earlier in the season, super down, lost all of his confidence, but he was judging himself on his results. It was always after a game, no matter how well he played, he was down on himself because he didn't score didn't get an assist, was a minus, something like that. And all he was judging himself on were his results, and they weren't there at the time, which then made him play out of character. So now he's not doing the things he needs to to play well. So I was like, we need to completely reframe your mindset. Tell me the five things that make you your best. And Tof and I talked to uh, Dr. Cassidy Preston recently on our podcast, who's a big sports psychologist, about this. So I'll go over it quickly, but I got him to only focus on those and – devoid of the result if he didn't score if the team didn't win if he didn't get a point i don't care judge yourself on these five things that make you your best you because on a long enough timeline if you do those well and we know those get the results you're gonna get better results more often but also and this is how i think you can be more resilient to the outside world is that he didn't get the results the team lost the game but if he did four out of those five things well, he can leave the rink with his head high knowing, OK, I did these things that make me really good, really well. And it also gives you something to pinpoint right away. Ooh, but that fifth thing, I didn't do that well. And instead of losing confidence and like, why didn't I score? Why didn't I do this? You can pinpoint down, OK, I did this really well, which I need to do. I did this really well, ooh, but I didn't do that thing well. So this week, I'm really going to focus on that. Now you focus on that during practice. Now you build your confidence back up to where it was before a bad game or whatever, right? And then it just becomes a positive feedback loop of continuing to do that instead of just 
did I get the points? Did I get the result? No, now my confidence down. Now I won a game, my confidence is up. So instead of that roller coaster of emotions, you can be a little bit more even keel. I just think it's so important to have something that's totally in your control, like you talked about, Jeff. Like, what is something that I, I can focus on that no matter what the end outcome of this game is, I can control that result. And, and Topher, to your point, I think it's the same way in business as it is in sports. Um, as an entrepreneur, like, you're going to have successes and failures. And sometimes the best days you have are just the days that you just controlled the things you could control and you just let go of the things that were outside of it. Can you can you give any examples of the things you could control in your games that didn't have to do with results? Yeah, so for me, um, some of the biggest routines that I had that helped to develop confidence for me was, um, so for pitchers specifically, um, in between starts, we would throw bullpens. And bullpens are like a way to practice. So think about this in hockey as like you're practicing your shot and you're going out there. And I don't know about for you guys, but when, whenever I was practicing, it would be so easy for me to, let's say I have 25 pitches I'm throwing and I just nail 24 of them. But that 25th pitch, like I bounced the, the breaking ball. And then afterwards, all I'm thinking about is the one pitch I threw that wasn't good. And I'm not even thinking about like, dude, I just nailed 24 in a row, but like the 25th one, I missed it. And instead of that, like almost gamifying the situation and then walking into like whatever that practice setting was and saying, Hey, what is the one thing that I'm going to work on? And the example that like I would give is like, hey, I want to just fully commit to every single pitch I throw. So like totally inside of my control, like I can go 25 out of 25 on that. And it doesn't matter where the ball is going. I know if I fully commit to that, it's going to help give me more confidence when I step out there on the field. And ultimately, that's what is going to be the separator when I'm out there is like, can I actually commit to what I'm trying to do? So Anything that you can do, at least for me, in a practice setting that could kind of gamify the situation and leave me with the end result of like, no matter what I do in this situation, it's going to be good, um, was what I tried to focus on. Love that. I, I love what you said, too, about just like fully committing to every pitch you're going to throw. I mean, how powerful is that? When I hear you say that, because like it means you're in the moment. And, and that is one of honestly, like the hardest things to do nowadays is, is to just live in the moment for whatever reason, we're hardwired to worry so much about things that happened in the past, be anxious about stuff that hasn't happened yet in the future. And, and we don't focus on the here and now and, and not even just focus, but really enjoy the here and now and have gratitude, gratitude for the here and now at the end of the day, it's all we have is, is the moment that's right in front of us. And so if we can find a way to immerse ourselves in what we're doing. It's just such a value add, not only for our productivity and our performance, but also our mental health and our enjoyment for what we're doing. So when you talk about like being able to fully commit to every pitch that you're throwing and, and, and kind of being in the moment, is the routine a part of that? Is that, is that a part of kind of like miyagi yourself into being able to be in the present moment or how did you find the the energy and, and how, what were some, maybe some ways to, to, to get yourself in the moment as you were going through your journey? Yeah, I think baseball is a little bit unique uh, compared to hockey. When I think about hockey, everything happens so fast, like outside of you being on the bench, like you don't really have time to think when you're on the ice, you're just reacting to things that are happening around you. Whereas in baseball, even when you're out there on the field, the game is so much slower. So you have this time in between every single pitch. So like you throw a pitch and there might be 15 seconds before you throw that next pitch. So there's a lot of thinking that is involved with that. So for me, it was mostly trying to focus on like, hey, what can I just consistently do over and over again? So for me, like every time I would come set, I take the sign. I agree to the sign. Essentially, I take a breath. I set my sights on the target. And for me, like, One of my big things was like, I would always aim small, right? So like, instead of saying like, I want to throw this fastball down and away, I'd be looking at like the string on the catcher's glove and be like, Hey, I'm going to throw it towards that string on the catcher's glove. I take my breath and then I would go. So it was always consistent for me. So then no matter how good I was feeling that day or how bad I was feeling that day, I knew that like, Hey, this is one thing that I can always fall back on. That's awesome. And talk about like maybe the times where you felt like you didn't maybe have your best stuff. 
you know, you get out to the mound and, and you're playing in front of 50,000 people and, you know, you, you go through your, your warm up routine, you, you go through your, your bullpen session, you go out there, you're, you're going through the first inning and you're like, man, I'm going to have to battle today. <laughs> Cause as, as yeah. happened in hockey, that's what we like. There's times where our legs don't feel right, or maybe our hands, we're not handling the puck in the way that we like to vex. Um, I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to say it vex there. Um, wow. Ouch. <laughs> but true. <laughs> um, but like there, there are days where you just kind of know that you, you're going to have to gut through this one. Did you have those days in baseball? And then like when you, or if you did have those days, how did you, how, what was your mindset like to kind of get through that and gut through it? I, I think it goes back to, again, like trying to gamify the system, but this is something that really, it was a challenge for me to figure out because for so long I wanted to even though I knew that there would be days that I wouldn't have my best stuff, you always want to have your best stuff, right? Like you put in all the work and then you get out there and you're like, as a pro, especially when you're doing it so often, you can feel almost right away. You're like, man, I, I, I don't have it today. But I can remember some of the best games I had, some of the most rewarding games I had were those games that you don't have it and you grind through it and you make, you know, the end result ends up being, well, you keep the team in the game. And that's, I think, where you really learn a lot about yourselves. So for me, what I would try to do is, let's say I didn't have it that day, right? I have four pitches and maybe two of them are working. Okay, like let's just transition and use the two that are working rather than trying to figure out how I'm going to get three and four to work. Like let's just focus on the things that I can do today. Like what can I do to keep the team in the game even if I'm not punching out seven or eight or ten guys that night? I love that. And, and for hockey, for, for at least for me, and maybe Vex, it was for you the same, it was just like, again, kind of like the controllables, but like, if I didn't feel it, I was going to compete. Like the one thing that I was going to do is I was going to compete. I was going to win races for battles, you know, and I might not have had my best stuff. Like my legs didn't feel good or, or, you know, I wasn't making plays like I typically make. Um, but I was going to work <laughs> and I was going to outwork the next guy. And and we talk about that all the time, even from a recruiting standpoint, when I was coaching in college was like, you're not always going to have your, your a game, but what's your B game. You better have a great B game when your A game isn't there. And and by B game, I mean your competitiveness and your streaks and and like your just ability to to do all the little things and the intangibles and stuff. Um and you probably and, and can't have a B game as an MLB pitcher though. Cause like what are you what are you gonna do? Float them all in there? You know, like how do you how do you <laughs> like load it? <laughs> yeah, but you gotta compete though. Like no, you gotta you have that compete yeah, no. mindset and you gotta battle, man. Like, like is yeah, that, but like is that a all right, turn? so Dude, if you let's say an, an average MLB starter has 30 something starts throughout the year, like an easy thing that a lot of guys would say is like, I would say out of those 30 something starts to you, let's call it just 30 for easy math, that you're going to have your good stuff for 10 of those starts. So 10 times you're going to roll out there and be like, you know, unless things really don't go my way, like a pretty good chance, like we're winning the ball game tonight. And then 10 times you're going to be kind of in between where it's like, okay, I, you know, I kind of have it. I kind of don't like, I'm going to mix and match what I have. And then 10 times you're going to walk out there and feel like I wish anybody else was on the mound tonight, except for me, because I just not feel right. And you essentially, I mean, for most starters, like they, they know that coming out of the bullpen, like you get out of the bullpen for the game and you're like, all right, it's time to go. And, but I think, you know, Topher, to your point, like, Ultimately, it's about competing, right? You know, there's things that you can do. You have seven other guys behind you. You got the catcher behind the plate. It's not fully relying on you, but at the end of the day, like the starting pitcher sets the tone. So going back to what we talked about earlier, like confidence is a choice. At very least, you better roll out there with some confidence and be ready to compete because those guys are relying on you. They came to the ballpark to win a game, and, and nobody cares that you don't have your best stuff that day. You're professional. Like go out there and compete. Love that. Yeah. I I'm sh I would assume it's a little easier to have a B game in hockey because like like for me not the best hands so when they weren't there when I would be in warm ups and they felt like freezing cold stones and I'm like <laughs> oh my god what what am I gonna do tonight I knew I could chip it and hit a guy or chip it and just like try and get it or just move my crazy legs at least I could do that and something good's gonna come from that even if I have no mitts tonight so I just yeah I just think it's it. like what do you, what do you do in baseball when you when you have that that last 10 of that 30 like where you're not great when you say you compete as a pitcher what does that what does that mean like you're throwing in tight like just trying to jam the guy up like i i do not know anything about baseball so that's i'm honestly asking here 
Yeah, I think you're just you're just not taking as many chances, right? So in baseball, let's say you get a guy 0-2, so no balls, two strikes. And if you have your really good stuff, you might be trying to like pick on the corners for the next two pitches. If you have your bad stuff and you have, you know, three balls to play with, you're going right after him because you're like, look, I might not execute this pitch perfectly, but like I got him on his heels. And I think part of that's like understanding where you're at with you personally. You know, if I'm out there on the mound and the bases are loaded and I don't, I know I don't have my best stuff, like what can I do to essentially limit the damage, right? Like, I might not punch this guy out, but like I need to try to limit the damage. So like I need to, you know, in those games where I don't have my best stuff, I need to be more aggressive because I need to make sure I'm not trying to walk guys. If I can try to keep the ball in the ballpark, avoid the big innings. Okay. Like I might give up one, two, three, four runs tonight, but if I go six innings and give up three runs, the team's still in the game. If I go four innings and give up six, it might be over. Gotcha. That makes sense. That's that's kind of like similar mindset on a, on a little on a much smaller scale, more a shift by shift basis. But like on the penalty kill, as I got older, like if guys wanted to shoot from the outside, I would let them shoot from the outside all day because it was a less dangerous spot. And I'm like, yeah, like you're not going to score from there percentage wise most of the time. I'll let you take that or I'll, I'll take away the more dangerous option to give my goalie the chance on the on the less dangerous option. Um, so I, I totally get that. It, it, I got one more question here because I've been thinking about it the whole show, and I'm sure all of our listeners who know Toph and I love movie lines. Is rookie of the year Mighty Ducks to hockey players to baseball players? Like, is that what's the baseball movie that's like Mighty Ducks to baseball players? The Sandlot, or is there not one? I mean, I get. I mean, my my baseball movie is like Bull Durham for sure. Where it's like Ew. the minor league. That's not that though. So bull. <laughs> let me let me rephrase that because Vex, I think I know where you're going with this. So Bull Durham would be like our slap shot. It's gotcha. like kind of like just a famed movie that everybody loves. Talk about right. the days kind of gives you a really good glimpse into what things were potentially like. Mighty Ducks for hockey players is like the fake movie that, like, you know. Yeah, it, I feel it, like Mighty Ducks is kind of like Sandlot. I mean, where it's yeah, like, okay. you know, there's, it's a, it's like storytelling and like you're a young kid and you're watching it and you're dreaming about being out there, like in the middle of the summer, Wendy Peppercorn at the pool, like, you know, <laughs> oh, story, low shit. Story, baby. Oh, you're like, I can't take it anymore. But for me, for me, <laughs> funky Spence. butt loving, funky butt loving from <laughs> rookie of the year, all time greatest part of any movie ever in my childhood. <laughs> I'm just gonna start calling you funky butt loving now. That's not that's not that's definitely not my that's definitely not my movie. I like Sandlot better than that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Sandlot's way better, but funky butt loving. Did he just say funky butt loving? (laughs) Oh, you had Turner on uh on the podcast, former MLB pitcher, manages millions of dollars. What'd you talk about? Funky butt loving is what I talked about. Oh, I like it. You're, you're awesome. Um, Hey, so I I got another question for you. And and I think this is really relevant for a lot of the kids that, that are going to be listening to this. And, you know, you, you played on five different organizations in, in the major leagues You're part of five different organizations and just the way that youth hockey and, and even up into juniors and college hockey, the transfer portal is like, there's going to be a lot of times where kids are going in new situations, kind of blind and they got to, learn how to fit into a culture, learn a culture right away, figure out what kind of like the norms are within the group and stuff like that. Um, if you had advice to kids that were, you know, going to the next level or potentially are, are going to a new team for the next year or in junior hockey, maybe even getting traded um, to, to another team, like what would some advice be to um, some kids who are, are stepping into a new place and, and want to compete and, and kind of want to be a part of the group right away? I think the first thing I would say is like, leave the past in the past. Um, it can be so easy to walk into any new setting and think about, you're like, oh, well, it wasn't like this at the last place I was, or I didn't have to do this at the last place, or, you know, this challenge that I'm now facing, it wasn't like that where I was at before. Just leave the past in the past, man. Move on. You're onto a new thing and understand that like you have this incredible opportunity to make a first impression. You have this incredible opportunity that the first day that you walk out there, they're going to get whatever that impression of you that they're going to have in their mind of like, this is who you are as a player. This is who you are as a teammate. And I think it 
it goes so far, especially in the locker room. If you walk in that first day and like you're going around, and you're just like letting all the guys know who you are, and you're not the guy that's sitting in the corner and look like I'm not one that's like this big social butterfly that wants to go around and just meet a bunch of new people. But like I played on a bunch of different teams. And the best thing I ever did was when I walk in the locker room, I went around and shook everybody's hand, like told them who I was, told them I was like happy to be here, like if I could help in any way, just looking forward to being part of the team. And I think that goes so far in any new setting. That's awesome, man. That's really good. And uh, one other question that I have for you, and I want to get to kind of what you're doing now in, in life after baseball, but, you know, Jeff and I, we love high achievers and you've had the opportunity, like we like kind of like, I don't want to say study greatness, but like, we're really interested in what makes people great. And you had the opportunity to play at the highest level of baseball and, and be surrounded by people who were the elite of the elite of the elite in, in, in the sport. So I wanted to ask you if there was a, a specific team that did things that were just above and beyond that you were like, wow, or a specific player that you crossed paths with that you were like, wow, like this person's just different. You know, this person is special. Um, was there any anybody or any team that really sticks out that you were like, this guy's got it, or this this team, this organization's got it? I would say two. So on the personal side, Max Scherzer stands out for me just in terms of the level of detail that he would go into with his routine was was pretty incredible. Like he would throw bullpens in full uniform. And I can remember he was coming back from like the injured list one time and he had like the national anthem playing for a bullpen because he wanted to really simulate what it was going to feel like when he got back out there. So like national anthem plays, he warms up, he does like his whole thing. So that level of detail. And then also he would come into spring training every single year and have like a specific goal of what he wanted to do to get better. And this was, he was in the middle of a $210 million contract at the time. Like the guy had essentially made it. He was a future hall of famer and he's coming into spring training being like, yeah, here's specifically what I'm going to be working on this spring training. Almost like this mindset of like, I'm continually trying to make the team. And then on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, from a team perspective, you know, I felt like the Cubs did a really good job of doing the boring things really well. And what I mean by that is like things that we can all do, no matter what your talent, and your ability level is. They told people the truth. They communicated really well with you and they stood by whatever they told you. So like all three things that we can all do. But that was one thing that, especially in professional sports, is was kind of unique, honestly. Like, I got told a million half-truths throughout my career. Like, oh, this is going to happen, and then it doesn't end up happening. And they just they just shot you straight. Like, here's where we see you. Here's what you need to get better at. If you get better at that, here's where you're going to be. If you don't get better at that, here's where you're going to be. So I think two opposite ends of the spectrum for people to think about. One, with the level of detail. And two, with just doing the really boring things really well. That's what greatness is, man. <laughs> it's, it's, it's preparation and doing the boring things well. The it's, amount of times that I explain su success in anything, I think, is being able to do monotonous things over and over and over really well. And like I had a life coaching meeting literally right before this, which is not an athlete, just this this woman that I work with, you know, helping her with workouts and her career and mindset, and nutrition and goal setting and you know, managing her, her bank account and stuff, like trying to pay down debt. And like the biggest thing we talked about tonight is like, you got to stick to the deep, the, the seemingly insignificant daily details. And it's just doing those well over a long enough timeline is how you become successful. It's also how you stay successful. I find personally that anytime that I am not as successful as I should be, or I'm not, you know, uh, um, not competing because I'm not competing. I'm not functioning at the level that I want to be at. And I zoom out. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm not doing my little details that I do every day. Well, like it's always comes back to that for me. Um, can you give any examples on like the daily details that everybody could do, but they did it well. Can you give any for the listeners? Yeah, I think for them, it was just being really consistent. I mean, it sounds so cliche, but Oftentimes, it goes back to like what we talked about before, like having a routine. And I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Um, one of the daily details that I do like every day is like I wake up in the morning and I go for a walk uh, super early in the morning and it helps me clear my head. And on like any one day, there might not be anything that really comes to mind where it's like, man, that like really changed my day, that changed my month, that changed my year. 
But over the course of 365 days, when you're out there walking at five in the morning in the darkness and you're just thinking about your thoughts and like what you're going to be doing that day, and things that you want to accomplish, they start to compound on top of each other. And Jeff, to your point, I've been around a million successful people in my life, whether it's athletes or whether it's entrepreneurs. And literally the one factor that they all have is they've just been willing to do the same thing for a really long period of time. Like there's no such thing as like an overnight success. I joke in our business today, when we help entrepreneurs, um, they'll tell me how successful they are. And they'll be like, yeah, I've been doing it 10 years. I'm like, oh, perfect. So you're just at the point of being an overnight success um, because they've just been doing something consistently for a really long period of time. And that's what's so hard for people. They think that like they have to do something crazy. They got to go to the gym and just have this crazy Jeff Levecchio workout when in reality, like all they got to do is go to the gym on the days they don't want to for 30 minutes and do something. Something. But if they do do a Jeff Levecchio workout, they will look like a great god, <laughs> Especially on Train Heroic. Check Especially on Train Heroic. <laughs> Vex, what about you? A, even I can give a shout out to that. Yeah, <laughs> Vex, what about you? Like you asked Jacob the question, but like, and, and you even said yourself, there's, you know, you know when you're at your best and when you're not, and when you're not, you're not doing the little things. So like, what are some of the little things that you need to do every day to, um, to be at your best? There, yeah. For me, simple ones. Don't hit snooze on my alarm. I'm way better when I wake up when the alarm goes off right away. Like there's no doubt in my mind, I'm in a better headspace. like snoozing. I always feel like crap. So when I'm, when I get into a lull or something, I usually look back and okay, I'm snoozing my alarm two or three times. I'm not getting up to where I need to be for me. Also, I'm not making my workouts a, a, a very high priority in my day. Obviously when I played, that wasn't a problem at all. That was like, I was so dialed in, but now as an entrepreneur and, you know, having two businesses that, that I'm growing both of them at the same time online and in person. Um, and then, you know, even, maybe even another one like social media as that's like kind of a business now for me too, a little bit in a sense, I have a lot going on and sometimes I'll be like, okay, well, like I'll just shorten my workout today. Cause I have to do this. But always when I go down that path, I get upset with myself and I also realize like I don't feel like I'm functioning as high as a level because I know I like cheated at something and that like really gets at me and and it kind of starts this like negative spiral. So I got to stop. I got to nip that in the butt right away. And it's just like for me, it's like little details that don't allow me to function as well. Not eating enough, not drinking enough water, not getting in my full workout, getting in enough of it, but like for my like physical health, but for my confidence and stuff, I need to be doing what I like to do. It helps me with that and not hitting the snooze button. For me, those simple ones, like if I can go back and just address those, the rest of my day just keeps going along on the right track. Are there ones for you that you've noticed, Toph, where where these are kind of things that not not non-negotiables, but like if I do these, I'm way better. Yeah, I, I think for me, one really, really big one is planning the night before what I'm going to do the next day. Um, if I don't do that and I show up at my desk when it's time to get stuff done and I have to figure out what I need to do that day, I'm already way behind. And then, yeah, it's a spiral, man. It's a spiral because then you're like, ah, I didn't do this. And then you don't feel as confident in the day. And then it's much easier to get distracted for things that you need to do. Um, and, and so for me, a big one, I learned this one from Craig Valentine, like make your to-do lists and, and, and plan the night before for the next day. For me, that's a really, really big one. And, um, and, and another one is just like being present with my kids. Like when I have other things on my mind, um, and I'm not present with my kids, that just really affects my mood because kids, Jacob, as you know, like it, that they're wild cards <laughs> and you know, there's going to be challenging moments every day with them. And like, um, so I think really kind of like putting the phone away and, and trying to compartmentalize and really being present with my kids is another thing that <clears throat> is, is big for my me mental health, honestly. Um, so planning the night before and, and trying to be present with my family, those are, those are big ones for me. Love that. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's transition to what you're doing now, Jacob. And, and, you know, you're, you are, you're a mentor now and you're helping a lot of people, um, 
you know, setting them straight on, on, on the path that you were on and, and helping them to kind of navigate their journeys and stuff now, particularly financially. Um, so what was the transition out of baseball like for you? And, um, what are some of the things that you have, you are using today? Um, some of the life skills or some of the tools of the trade that you learned while you were playing baseball, um, that, uh, that helps you to be successful in what you're doing now. I can think of one word that the transition was like, I would say humbling. And I think <laughs> every athlete would feel that way. Like you go from being a, a professional athlete to you get done playing and you've essentially like climbed the mountain to the top and then you're going all the way back down to the bottom. But I, the quicker you can understand that, like it just takes time to start building back up again and that like you need to start at the bottom and not try to shortcut the path, the better off you're going to be. I mean, my journey was, I got done playing and it wasn't like I had all these people calling me and saying like, Oh, here's all these amazing opportunities for you. It was like, I need to really sit down and think about what I want to do and, and humble myself and figure out like, okay, what does this next chapter of my life look like? And, and you finished your career real quick to go over that toe. If we didn't even touch on this, he finished his career in Korea, right? Yep. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. It's kind of funny that, you know, I was over in Japan for two years. He was over in Korea, and we talked, like, about some some very similar things. But um, I think this is something that a lot of athletes deal with, too, man, is that they finish your career, and they're kind of like, now what? You know? So so how did you get into what you're doing now after that kind of now what moment? So I essentially knew I loved – I always had things I liked outside of baseball and I've always loved personal finance, but I didn't really know like where I would take that. I wanted to try to educate people around it, but there's a million different kind of avenues you can go with that. So what I did and what I tell everybody to do is I basically went through my phone book and everybody that I thought was quote unquote successful. I just reached out to them and asked them if they could go to lunch with me. And I explained my situation and I'm like, if you were doing your job all over again, would you do it again? Like, would you go back through the path that got you to where you're at today? Would you go through whatever the grind was for the first eight to 10 years to kind of get you on the path that you're on today? And it was so helpful because one, I mean, a lot of these guys that have been successful, nobody had ever asked them about their path or their journey. They're not like well-known successful people that are on social media promoting what they're doing. They're just kind of living their life. So I was one of the few people that ever asked a question. So they loved being able to tell the story. And it was so invaluable for me because I got to hear like, well, originally I thought I wanted to go into investment banking. So investment banking is you're doing M&A activity for companies that are looking to buy and sell other companies, right? And essentially the path to get to where I wanted to get to was 15 hour days for six days a week for what's called seven years. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I have four kids. Like I'm not looking to do that. Um, but again, if I wouldn't have gone to lunch with somebody that was in investment banking, I wouldn't even have known that was the path. I would have said like, okay, this is where I'm going. I would have gone on that path and realized two years down the road, I didn't want to do it. So that was super helpful. Just reaching out to people that have, they've already been on the journey, like just ask the questions. And it goes back to being humble enough though, to say like, I don't have all the answers and I want to try to figure out what I should do next. That's great. I think that's, that's so phenomenal. Curiosity, like we talk about it sometimes, Vex, probably more me, like curiosity and, and having the ability and forethought to ask questions, I think is an absolute superpower. I think some of the most successful people innately are very, very curious. And when you're curious and you ask a lot of questions, you, you learn a lot of stuff and, and you get a lot of perspective and perspective is a very, very, very powerful thing. So I love the fact that you said that because especially like the other thing too, and Vex, we talk about all the time, like who are you surrounding yourself with? Who are the people you're having conversations with? Like Jacob, you talked about, I sought out people who were really, really successful. And those are the people that were influencing you. Those were the kinds of perspective that you were getting. And, and like, you know, just talking to the kids out there, like who are you following on social media? I've actually said all the time, like that's a conscious choice. Confidence is a choice. It's also a choice of the information that you're taking in and the perspective that you're getting as well. Um, and so that's, that's, I think that's awesome. I, I never really heard anybody kind of talk about it in that way. And uh, like, just like, I guess what, what did you learn from all these successful people? Like what, what was something that you took out of all of those conversations? Cause like, there's not one way to be successful, but there's certain trends or there's certain patterns or there's certain things that successful people do. Um, what did you learn in that process of, of kind of talking to a lot of those people? 
the biggest thing I learned was I didn't want to sacrifice one game for all the other games. What I mean by that is I didn't want to sacrifice this worldly game that we all have in terms of like being quote unquote successful, which usually has something to do with your financial situation. And I saw all these people that I'd reached out to that were quote unquote successful. And typically that was like some form of financial success because I could see it. And when I talked to them, I realized that not every single one of those people, I would want anything to do with their life because you can't have the good without the bad. And what I learned through that was like, okay, so I'm, I'm watching these people, they've won the money game, but because they've won the money game, they've essentially sacrificed everything else in their life. So they've sacrificed relationships, family, purpose, activities that they wanted to do outside of their work. And for me, there's a ton of things that are really important to me that are way more important than making the most amount of money. Um, I love entrepreneurship. I love solving problems. I love building our business, but I have four kids. Like they come before everything. My wife and I have been together since I was 15 years old. Like she's my ride or die. Like if I would sacrifice everything now for her, like, what does that say? So the biggest thing I learned was like, you can sacrifice everything you want to win one game if you want to do that. But understand that when you do that, you will lose all the other games. Oh, he's doing Mind. the Zoolander. My Zoolander. <laughs> wow, that was knowledge bomb right there. Thanks for dropping that on us. I love that. These are the, hey, these are the kind of things, by the way, listeners, that if you follow jacob on instagram the jacob underscore turner or even better his twitter which is absolutely hot fire on the reg multiple times a day it's the jacob turner no underscore instagram what did i say jacob underscore the jacob underscore turner is instagram twitter is the jacob turner and it is hot fire his twitter is heating up baby yeah how how um how how are your thoughts on the social media stuff? Because I follow you and, and it is really good stuff. You provide so much awesome perspective and tell some amazing stories that people can resonate with and, and just provide so much value. Um, how, how has that been for you, your journey? Because Vex and I both have had different journeys on social media and we'd like to think that we're providing some positive value for people. Vex, I don't know if people know this. Actually, no, I know everybody knows this because he says it every podcast, but he has a blue check mark on, uh, on Instagram. Hey <laughs> but um, how have you kind of taken to social media and used that to kind of amplify some of the positive things that you're doing and some of the messages that you've learned and stuff like that? Has that been stressful? Has that been and fun like what's your kind of social media been like your experience well i used to i used to really despise social media because when i was playing i had a twitter account i don't think i really ever had an instagram account but i had a twitter account and when you're not doing well as you can imagine the comments on your twitter are not good so for a while i just like deleted all social media i'm like i can't take this i'm not going to be able to perform i don't need like johnny in his basement telling me how i hung the three two breaking ball i know i hung the three two breaking ball johnny um but i do remember we used to at the when i was with the nationals um one of our things that we used to do on the road was we'd have people go up to the front and read mean tweets which is like what jimmy fallon used to do which is pretty funny because they would like read mean tweets about you had to read mean tweets about yourself no so, way like, that, that was always like kind of comical and what was funny was there was always like some subtle bit of truth about like the mean tweet like maybe it was about <laughs> like how the guy wore his uniform or like what he looked like on the field or like you know how he swung the bat or whatever it was so my journey from social media went from that to like no social media and then when i got done playing got back on social media and started posting and it's been great man i i try to post stuff that i wish i would have known i try to share stories that will hopefully benefit somebody somewhere by reading them. And, you know, it's almost been kind of therapeutic for me because I had such a unique career path. And for the longest time, like I didn't really want to talk about all the failures that I had because it didn't, I didn't see my career going like I went, like I was a ninth overall pick. I was a top 10 prospect in all of baseball. I was in the big leagues at 20 years old and we won the American league central. Like I was like, well, I'm going to make $200 million and be a future hall of famer. And then it was like a really choppy road from there on. So being able to share some of those learnings and some of those experiences has been, it's been fun for me. It's been therapeutic. I hope it's been helping people and uh, look forward to continue to do it. Dude, guys, 
follow him on Twitter. Like his Instagram's awesome. His Twitter is hot fire. Seriously, I I I uh, I've been following Jacob for a long time. I met him a few years ago, probably before COVID. We retired around the same time, and um, been following him since. And his his Twitter, I learn a lot every day. Like seriously, about money, about life, about sports. Um, put stuff about parrot. Just talks about everything. I'm I'm, and I told Tove before his podcast. I said, bro check out check out jacob's twitter like you're gonna love his twitter it's very similar to how you think and stuff so um i just want to keep plugging it because i think you provide a lot of good there absolutely Appreciate man. That. Well, jacob thanks so much for taking the time to to hop on here with us today it's such an amazing story and uh such an amazing perspective so uh we really appreciate your your time and thanks for sharing everything with us thanks guys appreciate you having me